Welcome to Great News for the World. My friend, about 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ said he was going to return to this earth after he ascended to heaven. He not only said he would come back, but he said very clearly and distinctly he would come back quickly. That was 2,000 years ago. Why hasn't he come? What's happened? My name is Frank Abel. My guest is Mr. Jim Stiles. Together we'd like to answer that question. And to answer that question, we go to the Bible in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 12, where we read, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Well, there it is. If you wondered where the Bible said it, there it is. There was Jesus Christ in his last message to men, telling them that he would come quickly and that his reward was with him to give to every man. Now, why hasn't he come? Was Jesus wrong? Did Jesus make a mistake? He did say in his gospel records that he didn't know the day or the hour. But then again, in the book of Revelation, it says that this was a revelation that God gave unto him. So I'm sure that Jesus really knew when he'd come back. And it wasn't because he didn't understand things that he said he'd come back quickly. There must be another answer. Well, people have for a lot of, I would say centuries now, Jim, really, they've been saying, where is the promise of his coming? And as far as uh, people who believe in the Bible is concerned, for some, they've been a little wildered under this. They've, they've been wilting because they can't find the answer of why Jesus said this. And some have despaired of his coming altogether and said, well, I guess we were wrong in saying he would come. Others have said, well, he came, but we didn't see him. When, of course, the Bible distinctly says that when Jesus would come, he would be so clear and distinct it would be like lightning. Friend, there's another way to look at this. Jesus said over and again in the book of Revelation, where he made this quote from, that it was a book written for individuals. It was a book written for him that has an ear to hear. It wasn't written like you might see it on a national newspaper. It was written for individuals, so that only individuals would really be able to understand what he said. Now, if you know what the Bible teaches about life and death, you will know that we don't have long to live. None of us do. In terms of the 2,000 years that we've been mentioning here about the start of this prophecy till the time we're living, well, none of us have come even close or will come close to living that long. Our life is like a little vapor. It's here and gone. It's like the flower of the field that comes up, it's beautiful, and then it withers and dies. You know, for an individual, it's really quite true that he comes quickly. Because if we're here and uh, we live, say, 70 years, we get our three score and 10, and then we die, what is your next conscious thought? The next conscious thought for a believer in Jesus Christ when he dies is the moment of resurrection when he stands before Jesus Christ who has returned. So, in a sense, with a person's lifetime plus, if you would like, one second, the Lord has come. Now, the problem is this. Not anyone, I don't think anyone can say, look, I know when I'm going to die. Now, some people know they're dying, and they know they're very close to death, but no one can really say when they're going to die, and too many people die very unexpectedly. Are they prepared for the coming of the Lord, which is their next conscious thought? There's great wisdom in what Jesus said. Much for us to benefit by, that he comes quickly to us, because none of us could ever be so prepared in our life that we could then say, well, Jesus, come. I'm all ready for you. I'm completely prepared to go to judgment. He comes quickly, and that is a real lesson to us. Well, we've been talking, maybe not emphasizing enough, the fact that we're very certain he's going to come. Jim, can you give us some idea of why we're so certain about his return? Well, Frank, the reason that we're so certain is because God has the ability to foretell events. God can foretell the future, and he's done this in the pages of the Bible. 
that God has foretold many things that are going to be taking place in our lifetime, in our near future. And so we can be certain that Jesus is going to, be return, going to return, Frank, because God has foretold this in the Bible. Now, I'll give you an example of how God foretells events, an example in the Bible. If we look in the book of Romans, in chapter 4, in Romans chapter 4, at verse 17, Paul is speaking about Abraham, the man Abraham in the Old Testament. And Paul says in Romans 4, verse 17, As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not, as though they were. So what Paul is indicating here in Romans is he's referring to the Old Testament times about Abraham. And he's showing here, Frank, how God predicted to Abraham, he foretold with Abraham, that he had made Abraham the father of many nations. And this was long before Abraham had had enough offspring that he could be spoken of as being the father of many nations. In fact, at the time when this happened in Genesis, Abraham hadn't even had Isaac yet, his son. And so God was foretelling this to Abraham at this time, telling him that God had done it. And he had already made him the father of many nations. And this was, this was an example here of how God can foretell events that are going to take place. Now, I'll give you another example, Frank. In the Old Testament, in the book, in the prophecy of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 53, in Isaiah 53, this is a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet this was written down long before the Lord Jesus Christ ever lived on earth. And here is what Isaiah says about the Lord. And this is, in this case, he is foretelling what Jesus was going to do. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Now this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 53, this is a case where God was foretelling that this is what Jesus was going to do. And Frank, we know from Bible reading that in the New Testament that Jesus actually did do this. And so this was another clear case where God had foretold something that was going to take place. Now, many people today make predictions, predictions about events that are maybe going to take place and maybe they won't. But God has the ability to actually foretell. He knows that an event's going to take place. And when God does this, he's foretelling that this is going to happen. It isn't like the predictions of the people today who predict that some event is maybe going to take place in next year or maybe in 10 years, and they don't really know if it's going to happen or not. It's just a prediction. But when God writes something in the Bible, God is actually looking down in history, and he sees that this event is actually going to occur. So it isn't a case of maybe prophecy is going to occur, or maybe it isn't. But when God writes it in the Bible, God is actually foretelling that it is going to happen for sure. Because he's actually seen down through his eyes in history that it is going to take place. You know, Frank, one of the greatest cases of, that are of importance to us in God's ability to foretell is that God has foretold that the Jews taking the city of Jerusalem and the Jews going back to the land of Israel today God has foretold that this is one of the greatest signs that indicate that Jesus will return soon. It's interesting that, because a lot of people take exception to maybe the use that God makes of the Jews. But if you read the Bible, of course, Jim, I'm sure you're aware of this, that the Bible is a Jewish book. The Bible doesn't pretend to record the history of some of the modern nations that we have today or any of the nations that have, say, died out and passed. But the Bible does record Jewish history. And God doesn't say that some of the nations today are his witnesses, but he does say that the Jews are his witnesses. Now, they don't go around willing witnesses talking you know, to people about God, but they're witnesses in the sense that what the Jews do is foretold, as you've said in the Bible. It's a very distinct point to be made. Now, God works with the Jews in another important way. We've mentioned and we're going to talk about the reasons that God does this and what he's going to do with what we would say are his people, the Jews. But we look back in recent history and go back even a few centuries before that and what people 
what people on the face of this earth have been persecuted more than the Jew? And we go back as the prime example in the recent world war to think of the millions that died and how they were treated. Now that wasn't exceptional. It may have been a number, but what was done was not exceptional. The Jews were expelled from, well, you think of the country and you will probably find some time in their history where the Jews were expelled from it. Now, is God pleased with that? Is God pleased that his people, who he's called out to be his witnesses, are scattered, are persecuted? Well, they're doing, they're, they're being persecuted, and they're being scattered because of the fact they have rejected God and they have rejected Jesus Christ. But there's a score to be settled in the fact that the people who persecuted them weren't any more righteous than they were. And the time is coming, and the time, as the prophets reveal, is very close at hand, when God is going to settle this, and there will be justice done, which I suppose, Jim, we could say that over the ages has never yet really been done with respect to how people have treated the Jews. Now, we find most important to us, most encouraging, that in 1967, Jerusalem was freed. That might not have seen a, a very significant event at all. I guess a lot of people just let that one go right over. But the Word of God said, Jesus himself, in Luke chapter 21, verse 24, that when Jerusalem would be finished of say, Gentile domination, it would then be freed, and this would be a great sign. So we see Jerusalem now freed from Gentile domination. Not completely, I might make, make out, because there are still signs of Gentile domination there, and Jerusalem must yet be overcome by a Gentile nation. But the Jews have control of the city, and it's a great sign of what is coming to pass upon the earth. Let me read that for you. Luke 21, verse 24. It says, they shall fall by the edge of the sword, shall be led away captive into all nations. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, the Bible uses the word until, until, a considerable number of times with respect to what we're talking about. It says that Jesus would be received by the heavens until the prophet's words of prophecy to come would be fulfilled. It says that Jerusalem would be downtrodden until the Gentiles be fulfilled. We find a number of things that must happen first. And I find this most significant, Jim, when I'm considering these things. Let's have a look at another verse. If we go to the book of Romans, chapter 11, you look at this one. I believe here's an example that shows us a link between what the Bible says would happen to the Jews and the return of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 11, and there at verse 12 we read, speaking of the Jews, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. And then going down to verse 15, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? So there you see the Apostle Paul, a New Testament writer, not writing off the Jews, but saying, yes, the Jews were cast off. Yes, there was an age called the Gentile age, but that age is going to be complete. And when Jerusalem is freed as we have seen it, we're seeing the ages changing. We're seeing the Jews now coming back into favor with God because it's the time of their fullness or their restoration. Now, if he says, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead, what's he talking about? He's talking about the resurrection. He's talking about the very event which is number one when Jesus comes back to the earth. Well, look, my friends, if we're seeing the Jews in the world today coming back to the land, if we've seen the Gentile domination in Jerusalem come to an end, we're seeing the very time that mentioned in the Bible would be the time when there would be the resurrection from the dead. So we find this a very exciting. We want to tell everybody about this. But there's one other thing I'd like to show you. 
I'd like to show you how this is linked back in the Old Testament prophet. For instance, Acts chapter 3 said, don't forget, that Jesus would be in the heavens until the words of these prophets were fulfilled. Well, there is an Old Testament prophet, Joel, by name. And in Joel's prophecy, at the chapter 3, at the very first verses, he talks about the time when God's going to settle the score with the, with the nations and the generations that have fought against the Jews. I'll just paraphrase this for you briefly, reading the important points. Joel chapter 3, verse 1, In those days and at that time, when I bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. He's doing it. Hey, there's the state of Jerusalem, in the uh, state of, the, of Israel, rather, in 1948. There's Jerusalem free, 1967. Obviously, the Jews are coming back. I will also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. God is about to do something very great in the earth. And I think this is the great news that is worth telling the world about, Jim. The message contained in this Bible is good news for the world. And the Bible very clearly brings out that Russia will soon invade Israel. The preparations for war in the Middle East today are God's proof that Russia is going to come down upon the nation of Israel according to Bible prophecy. Very much like this chart here illustrates that Russia will soon invade Israel and they're going to temporarily defeat Israel. And my friends, the Bible very clearly brings this out. In the prophecy of Ezekiel, in the Bible, in chapters 38 and 39, God says in the latter days he's going to bring a northern host down upon his people Israel that are gathered back in their land. And he's going to bring this nation against the mountains of Israel where the Jewish people are now living. And at that time, my friends, the, the Bible illustrates to us that God will go forth and fight against those nations. After Russia comes through and invades Israel, God says in chapter 38 that he's going to gather every kind of terror against Russia. And he's going to destroy the Russian army and he's going to bury Russia in Israel. And my friends, another Bible prophecy on the same subject. In Zechariah chapter 14, we find that the Lord God says that the day of the Lord is coming. He's going to gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. And at that time, Jerusalem will temporarily be taken by the Russian army. But then, my friends, Zechariah 14 tells us that the Lord is going to stand upon the Mount of Olives that then he's going to go forth and he's going to fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. And Zechariah 14 goes on to describe a war, like a nuclear war that's coming upon this world. And every one of us are going to be involved, my friends, whether we like it or not. Because when nuclear bombs start dropping in this world, that affects everybody. And some of us might think that we can just go on and eat and drink and be merry, but God is going to send Jesus back and it's going to change things, my friends. And that's why we should be looking into the Bible message today. Because the Bible message tells us about the prophetic events that are going on right now in the land of Israel, the war that's going to come. And so, my friends, that's why we should be reading the Bible. And this preparation for war in the Middle East, it proves to us beyond any doubt, my friends, that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming soon. He's coming soon and he's going to set up God's kingdom here upon the earth. And when we look to the nation of Israel, my friends, we don't have to look anywhere else in the world, but we should keep watching Israel. That's the nation to keep our eyes on, because God's working in that nation today. God's going to use the Jewish people to form the basis of his coming kingdom. And so, my friends, this news of the coming kingdom of God, that the war that's going to occur in Israel, this is great news for the world, but it's also news with an urgency for you. That's exactly right. There is an urgency. And the urgency is all the more important to note when we consider that the prophecy concerning the restoration of Israel was such that it indicated the complete restoration would not happen prior to these events. We're not to expect that all the Jews are going to go back to Israel before this happens because the prophecy clarifies when I begin to do this. Now when you look around and you see the situation of the world, you sort of wonder, you know, we're very close to these things happening before our eyes right now. It's almost as though you can go to bed tonight and expect that maybe tomorrow's news broadcasts are going to tell you that these things are happening before our eyes. Well, Jim, it's very exciting, but, you know, we can't at that point just, just eliminate all the other signs that there are, too. How about telling us some of the other signs of Jesus' impending return? Well, Frank, we do live in exciting times today. 
because there are other signs that indicate that Jesus is going to be returning very soon. The terminal signs that are here for this generation to see are just amazing. We have the threat of nuclear war all the time. Nations are developing nuclear power, and it could be any day when one nation might want to use nuclear bombs upon another nation. There is also the problem or the sign today of the population explosion. Due to medical science in uh, doing better techniques of keeping people alive through operations and through modern drugs and so on, people are living longer. There's also the, the farmers seem to be, be growing more and more food, able to feed more people. And so we don't have times of famine like they did in the past. And so these two things combine to increase the population. And we're going through a time in which our population is just exploding all the time. There's also another sign that indicates that Jesus must return soon, and that is that natural resources are becoming depleted. We're probably very familiar with the fact that there's only a limited amount of oil available, and that when the oil runs out, then that's it. That the earth can't keep producing oil at the rate at which we are consuming it today. And not only oil, there's natural gas. The earth can't produce that as fast as we use it. And look at how water and clean air are being used up today, and they're being depleted, and we're using them up faster than the earth can restore them. There's also a problem today, Frank, in pollution, that pollution is becoming a major problem. We know from the cars that they pollute the air, but there's also water pollution that's going on because of industrial waste being dumped into rivers and streams. Sewage water is being dumped into some rivers in different areas, and they're polluting the waters that we have today so that the air is becoming polluted and the water, they're both becoming polluted. It's an interesting point when you mention that pollution, Jim, because you know, there's one important area that God sees, which he calls pollution, a lot of people just ignore altogether, and that is the way people are polluting the earth with pornography, with uh, immorality, and, and getting laws changed to allow this, so it's becoming the norm of life. People don't seem to realize, I don't think at all, that this is the very reason why God judged the world before, because he will not tolerate something which is so contrary to his purpose. Really amazing. Go on, Jim. Continue. That's an excellent point, Frank, because that type of mind pollution that's going on today is probably one of the worst types of pollution that could actually happen on the earth. There's also the problem of the immorality that's going on today, that the times, the social conditions are becoming like the days of Sodom when God thought it was necessary to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of the immorality that was going on in that city, the city of Sodom and the city of Gomorrah. Violence and crime keep increasing today. And those again are signs that are indicating that something has to happen. And we'd like to show you, as depicted in this little diagram here, how God has intervened in the earth at different times in history through the angels when there were great times of crisis that were occurring on the world. One of the biggest cases is the time of the flood, when God intervened and the world was getting so bad that God brought a flood and swept them all away. The time of Babel, as you notice here that the diagram indicates as the lines go up and down here that God intervened again at the time of Babel. And they were building a tower and God changed the languages of the people so they would have to stop. And again then we have the time of Sodom and Gomorrah, as you see where the lines again come up that the angels intervened and destroyed the two cities. And as we go further down this chart here, we can see that God intervened at different times of history of man. As the blips come up on the chart, we notice that these were times when the angels affected the course of man's history. There was a time when Jerusalem was destroyed because the Jews had rejected the Messiah, that God came and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. And if this is the pattern that God always intervenes when there's times of crises going on in the world, then look at, at the end of this diagram here, and we'll notice that the great time at the end when God intervenes is the time of crisis that we're going through today, Frank, because of all the types of pollution and problems that are going on in this world, that the final intervention of God will be when Jesus Christ returns. That the civilization, whenever the civilization becomes bad, God intervenes. And the times are very close today in which God will intervene. Well, Jim, I, I think that we have to consider now, what are we going to do about this? Now, here we have a, a situation where it's quite obvious. People see this like, apart from what we've been talking about in God's Word. People know that the earth is, is being depleted of resources. I mean, these things are, are very important. And, and Jim's point is a very valid one. 
And you can't just pass his point off and say, yes, but, you know, if you go back 500 years ago, the earth was filled with violence, there were wars. And if you go back 300 years ago, there was great uh, famines and there was diseases sweeping the nation. All the things that Jim has mentioned are terminal. When did people ever fight with weapons that they could obliterate earth, uh, life from the earth altogether? When was there really a problem that the earth would be so full of people that we, you know, we just couldn't get along. I mean, it's not a matter of people saying, well, look, you give me 50 square feet and you have 50 square feet and someone else, who's going to want to get along with 50 square feet? Well, there's problems of people like parks. You know, people have to eat. Uh, people want to go and see the country. You can, you can very well see that we, you can't talk in those terms. All oh, the earth is not filled and it wouldn't be filled until we all had just 50 square feet. People need room. And when we start to get cramped, we have problems with pollution that come to the point where there's diseases. We have problems of famine. There's all kinds of things are accelerated whenever we get too many people on the earth. I mean, this is quite proven in, in various studies on animals of where you get too many animals living together. But what should you do? Now, a person could say, fine, I guess I better build my bomb shelter, you know, and, and, and go under. Because uh, what am I going to do? To If there's going to be a nuclear war, I'm not going to sit out there and, uh, and get killed. Well, these things, of course, have been considered before when there was threats of nuclear war. Friend, there's one thing that you can do, which is the assurance the Bible gives alongside of reporting all these difficulties that will come. And that is that if a person has made a covenant with Jesus Christ, and what we mean there is if he accepts the Bible's message, accepts it, believes it, understands it, accepts it, goes through the waters of baptism, in other words, he, he could hardly accept it if he hasn't been baptized to show that he is accepting God's message, and then he overcomes all the problems, and there's lots of problems to overcome, and continues faithful to his words to the end, that person needs not fear. Christadelphians don't fear these things that are coming on the earth because we feel very confident that having put our trust in Jesus Christ, having done what he has said we should do, that we look upon these things maybe with a little more anticipation, a little more, maybe we even smiled too often for you in this program because we look on these things and say, there's the word of God being fulfilled, where other people say, yes, but look what it's going to do to me. You see, we're happy in the sense that the times of men are coming to a conclusion and that these great times that God has spoken of are actually going to soon be on the earth. That makes me feel happy and it makes all Christadelphians feel happy. We look with great anticipation to the news to see these things being fulfilled. We ask you to read your Bible and you can get the same feeling. And may God bless your study of his word.